Hi everybody, um, welcome to Friday the 26th of, um, it's March, <laughs> to the end of March indeed. Um, uh, so welcome to everyone who's joining us for our Facebook Friday weekly broadcast. I'm Kate Wakelin from Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia and those who've been around our community for a, a while will know that um, each week we hop in to do a, a bit of a video update or a, pick a topic of the week to, to talk about in relation to neuroendocrine cancers. You'll see that we've got um, a very special guest with us and some of you will recognise um, Dr David Chan's name and I'm going to introduce David a bit more in just a second but before I go on I just would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm broadcasting to you from which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and would just like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging I know that you are joining me from all four corners or eight corners of Australia and so there will be traditional owners of the land that you are joining me from. So I'm just uh, wanting to extend that acknowledgement to where you are as well. One of the things I love about where I live on Wurundjeri land is running along the Yarra River, which in the Woiwurrung language is called the Bitterung. So um, that's something that I very much appreciate where I am. And here in Melbourne, uh, it's been very grey, like lots of Australia, but we've got the weak sunshine pouring through my window at the moment. So I'm wishing a bit more sunshine to everybody up in the um, in the, in New South Wales and Queensland, where it's been very, very, very damp indeed. The other thing, um, just before I we launch into our questions with David, um, I just wanted to say that it's actually a year anniversary since we started these Facebook Friday videos. They've grown from a, a bit of a germ of an idea thinking that maybe um, we'd get a few people who might appreciate a, a bit of a chat um, uh, with now uh, hundreds of people logging in each week and, and um, some people joining us from overseas as well. So um, it's been a real privilege to to beam, beam into your um, into your devices for the past year and to focus on some subjects that are often quite frequently asked questions for our neuroendocrine cancer community. So thanks for having me along for the ride. It's been a really interesting learning experience and um, and and hopefully some useful information along the way for you. Um, so uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention was. Um, ongoing conversation about COVID vaccines at the moment. So stage 1B, we've officially started, but the, the rollout has been a little bit bumpy depending on where you are from. If you have active nets, you're certainly in that category. Um, I'll make sure I post a link to where you find information about where to get your vaccine locally. Uh, having said that, GP clinics around the country have been overrun with lots of people um, inquiring about that. So I think the, the take home message is that take a deep breath might not happen straight away. Um, so, and I'm seeking some more information. We had some questions from patients this week about where we might have people with very unstable carcinoid syndrome who've had lots of episodes of carcinoid crisis and also people where they've had lots of anaphylactic reactions to things in the past. Um, so I'm, I've just been um, getting some guidance actually from um, Pat Charles, who was one of our guest speakers um, a few weeks back to see um, what the provisions will be for people like yourself. So um, let me know if you're finding stuff about that in your local community and we can help disseminate that knowledge. Um, so you we will see the second face with me. So um, thank you so much, Dr. David Chan. David is from Royal North, not Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney and is one of our um, shining net oncologists. Um, a, a disclaimer at the very start of this conversation is that lots of people have already put in heaps of questions. Um, so uh, for David, which is exciting, um, but we know from the very beginning that we won't get through them all. So I'm attempting to kind of curate a mixture of questions that have been submitted ahead of time as well as what's coming in via the chat. Um, so if you see my eyes darting around, that's what I'll be doing. But really importantly for you watching at home, this is general information only and we will not be addressing um, uh, personal um, or, you know, or, or providing personal advice, personal treatment, um, management advice. Um, it's just generally nature only. And if you hear something that David has said that doesn't really fit with what you're experiencing, could just be that your tumour is different. Um, and often that is why things are different um, in, our, in our group as we learn over and over again. So each person with NETS is different, each NET is different. So for what you're hearing today, as always, take it back to your own doctor and ask them and they'll hopefully be able to give you an explanation as to 
you know, why you're on the treatment trajectory or being managed in the way that you are. Um, so I think that's all the disclaimers that I want to give. Um, we're very grateful to David for joining us today. And so if you're watching us on the live feed on our Facebook private discussion group, feel free to launch in with some questions and I'll attempt to, to um, be keeping an eye on those. But I wanted to start off with some questions that were put in by our community during the week. David, are you okay? I'm going to quick fire. Yeah, go going to, I, think I, the... I didn't realize it was your one year anniversary. You should have picked someone who is less, um, what's the word? Uh, I, I don't know and, and laughs inappropriately all over the place. If you know, Laughing anyway. inappropriately yeah. is absolutely mandatory to be associated with any of our patient community activities. So I think you're going to fit in right very, very well, good. David. Okay. So um, we're going to grill David. I think that was the, the, the title of the, the event that I put in the Facebook discussion group, which was um, maybe tempting fate, but um, I'm going to hop dive straight in the deep end. And um, we're actually, I'm going to start by, we've just had our recent European <clears throat> neuroendocrine cancer um, major conference that's normally held in Barcelona and Spain each mm. year. And we've been um, all, uh, on the computers because we held it virtually this year. Um, David, I know that you were a part of that conference that you attended and I wondered if you could give us a bit of a nutshell, what's been the most exciting stuff to come out of that conference for you this year? Hmm. Um, thank you. So the most exciting thing was the flights to Barcelona, the tapas and all the alcohol that I drank there non-existently in a virtual setting. Um, so hopefully that'll be the case the next while. And I guess like, you know, the silly things aside, it's always nice to meet up with neuroendocrine colleagues who, you know, things just arise organically as you talk about neuroendocrine tumours. So that's something that we're missing, you know, virtually. I think the meeting in Barcelona time was from about like 8.30 at night until four in the morning so you know it was good for um putting you know watching after you put the kids to bed but actually it's been a bit hard to stay up for the last part um i guess um the focus of enet is often not on the biggest trials in neuroendocrine tumors you know not it's usually not the place where the final results of big phase three trials are that's usually asco which is the one the american one in chicago in june but where I find it interesting is as a summary of look what's happened over the last 12 months, and maybe that's a better place to focus that question. And also, well, what's coming up ahead in terms of interesting things in terms of research. So I guess um, I'll try and cover three things really quickly. One is radiomics. Two is new TKIs, new tablets as treatments that may be available. And the third thing I think is um, increasing uh, research about the patient experience. So. Um, in terms of the first one, um, radiomics, um, radiomics is one of these catch-all terms. So um, you've probably heard of data science and data scientists, and really radiomics is, or multiomics, depending on which talk you go to, is a talk that's almost obligatory at every conference now, which is, can we use smart statistics to understand things on a deeper level than someone like me going, oh, maybe like age is a relevant uh, thing in selecting therapy? Can we chuck all patient variables into a computer, into a black box and sort of go, well, can we predict one thing better than another? Um, that's the promise of it. The reality is a little bit more complicated because, well, how comfortable are people with having decisions made for them by a black box? You know, um, what if I told you, well, you should have treatment X, Y, Z. And then you ask, well, doc, why should I have it? And normally I'd say, well, because you're this grade rather than that grade, because we looked at the imaging. But I don't know how comfortable I'd be as a clinician saying, because the black box told me, although I actually don't feel like it's the right option, you know, and how comfortable are both patient and clinician with wearing that? So I think for me, even if we did it really well, and there's some technical factors that I can waffle on about, but really that's one thing that will prevent it from going to prime time. How comfortable are we with treatment decisions being made by machines? without a basic rationale behind it. Um, so watch this space. There's stuff happening, nothing positive, nothing that's better than humans, but you know, I look forward to being out and done out of a job or at least being helped by a machine in the next 20 years. Um, second thing, um, new tablets are potentially on the horizon. So a lot of the things being looked at at the moment are in two categories. One's PRT and modifications of that. And two is new TKIs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And you might've heard of some of these. So 
um, for people with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, everolimus, afinitol, and also the second one being sunitinib, sutent, uh, tablets that are funded by the government, um, everolimus. There is some evidence in other settings, but not so funded, unfortunately. And that's a bit of a gap at the moment. Um, there are other tablets, and there was one called surufatinib, which is yet another one of these tablets. And have you noticed over time, the names just get longer and longer, so you can't pronounce them? Um, I think it's a marketing ploy. Anyway, um, there was a positive trial in, in China looking at neuroendocrine tumors and surufatinib. Uh, there's two things, I guess. One is, look, we think that there's some differences between people of different nationalities and genetics. And what about the nets? Like, you know, do they respond the same way? And we know that, for example, in gastric cancer, the drugs that you use in Asia for patients of Asian descent are not necessarily drugs that translate easily to Western patients. And, and so this is one of those things where, look, watch this space. It would be interesting to see whether this drug is active. There are other drugs that are similar, which have promising trials in the US, for example, called cabozantinib. The problem is none of these are easily available at the moment. Definitely none of them are funded. Cost implications, five, 6,000. And there's no evidence that they're better than the drugs we have at the moment. So it's one of these watch this space kind of things, but it was interesting to see. Thirdly, patient experience, always important. Ongoing research to show that there's uh, definite levels of psychological distress. I guess the question is how do we support that? How do we acknowledge that? But how do we have enough structure to, to support it, because I think for me as a clinician, well, it's important to acknowledge and talk about it. But then if there's a fixed time for the consultation and you can run over and run under sometimes to allow for it, but no one wants to see a doctor who routinely runs two hours late, right? Then, well, how do we put the supports in place so that people get the support they need? That's, that's really hard. So I think there's ongoing research about that. Um, Simone, the CEO of NECA did a great talk on sort of patient directed experiences during uh, ENET. So have a look at that, obviously, over time, but, you know, interesting. In that is um, fantastic in a nutshell, David. I'm just wondering about those two drugs that you mm. discussed. Yep. Is there any likelihood of clinical trials that will hit Australian shores mm. with those drugs? <clears throat> there are roles for trials where we can lead the way, I think, in Australia, particularly involving, say, nuclear medicine, where we have expertise, particularly involving smaller trials where we sort of go, look, if we put these two things together, is that an interesting idea? And so those are things where, look, even acknowledging the difficulty of development in the market, well, it is something where there are things that we want to explore and, and provide options. I think putting it in perspective, for instance, well, the question is, well, why can't you guys fund something? You, you know, why does it have to be a pharmaceutical company? And I think Part of the answer is, well, patients, I think, in my experience, sometimes you want to use old drugs better, but the really exciting thing is if there's a new drug that works really well. And so for London for Money, can we take that crown away from them? They will be developing the drug. They put the money into developing it. So they will want to run the trials. But the second thing is that trials are sometimes really expensive. So, you know, for example, trials can be up to $20,000 a patient and you need 100, 200 patients to to run a, I guess, large trial, you know, and some of the trials are even larger, as you know. And, and so when you add up the sums, you know, millions are usually out of the realms of academic funding. And so these are things where, look, we're so grateful for donations to any organization, you know, whether there's NECA, our research, other people's research, we don't really care. We just want to sort of keep pushing the ball forward. But these are some of the difficulties that we face in thinking about trials and making them happen. Um, it's really fascinating to hear your insights, David. And Before I totally, you know, like, I, as you guys probably know, I, I do collaborate with different pharmaceutical companies. We do do good things. It's just not in that particular arena of large trials. There are things happening in Australia, as you probably know. We do trials on new PET scans, on passive for example. There's a trial registered in Australia under that at the moment. So there are different things going on. It's just not necessarily the biggest thing. And so the way we sort of go is, look, if we don't, if using energy in that arena is not the way that we can contribute, what can we do? And so that's where we sort of say, look, rather than, you know, uh, changing things that we cannot change, how do we be a positive force? How do we create things that really do help the, the patients? And then sort of say, well, no, those guys are not me, but why do I have to be involved in everything? You know, if they're doing good stuff 
and the things that will flow our way in the next little while, then, then that's fine. So you mentioned two things there that I want to come to. Yeah. Um, and maybe we'll start with the scanning because one of the questions that um, uh, one of our group members put in was around the um, the CO, C, 64 CU Sartate PET imaging, which is copper Sartate yeah. for those playing at home. It makes much more sense when I use the non-hieroglyphical terms for things. But um, uh, so you, you mentioned about scanning. That's a question that's come through. And then the other drug that you talked about was pasreotide. So maybe could you talk about that? Because I know that there's clinical trials happening right now with copper Sartate. So maybe could you explain just a little bit about that? I know we're going to ask you to mm -hmm. talk about lots of things yeah, in sure. a very shallow way so we'll try and get enough depth to understand it okay. but knowing okay. there's lots of questions yeah so look before we talk about 64 coli, uh, copper sartate i think it's important to say look what are the parts of something that you can use for a pet scan okay so when we talk about a dota 10 pet that's actually not the full name the full name is 68 Dota Tate, 68 gallium Dota Tate PET scan. And the 68 gallium is just a radioactive form of a metal, which is gallium. It's not the usual form that you find, you know, non-radioactive form, it's a radioactive form. And as it decays, it gives off that energy and the PET scan picks it up. So there's slight differences between that and 18 fluorine, 18F, which is what you use for the FDG PET scan. And 64 called copper is just another one of these things. I'll talk about why you might use one or the other later on. The middle part is called a chelator, which is a chemical linker between the first part and the third part. And you go, well, the first part's the radioactive thing. What's the third part anyway? What is it linking to? And the answer to that part is, well, that's the part that goes to the neuroendocrine cells or whatever cells you want. So the Tate in Dota Tate is octreotate. What that is, is it's like octreotide, right? It sounds kind of the same. And it goes to the somatostatin receptor in the neuroendocrine cells. So what actually happens when you have a normal dota PET scan is you get the injection. The Tate part, the octreotate part, goes to the neuroendocrine cells if they have enough receptors, blah, blah, blah. And then the 68 gallium goes into the cell around that area, gives off the radiation that gets picked up by the scanner which is how we know where the neuroendocrine cells that express the receptors are. And lutate should work the same way. So lutate is 177 lutetium dotatate. So the dota is the same, the tate's the same. So if you inject the stuff, it should go to the same places, right? That's why we use PET scans to figure out where the lutate is gonna go. So 64 copper sartate, 64 copper is another one of these radioactive things. So for the trials, well, maybe the imaging time is a little bit different because, well, maybe it takes a little time for it to get into the right place and give off the radiation. The sartate, the octreotate is the same, but the linker middle bit might be a little bit different as opposed to dota. So what it means is the first bit's different, the 64 copper rather than the 60, um, 68 gallium. The second bit's a bit different, the linker, and the octreotate is the same, which is it should go to the same places. So 64 copper sartate is um, a drug that is being developed by a company. Um, and uh, there was a publication on uh, 10 patients uh, last year, uh, sorry, a year and a half ago uh, by um, the Melbourne group. And currently we're um, engaged in trial with, with them together. Um, where really we're trying to figure out, well, okay, we know we can do the scan. We had 10 people, we know they didn't get too sick, otherwise we wouldn't be doing the trial. Um, but is it better than Dota Tate PET? So that's one of the things we're doing at, at the site and trying to get that up and running over the last little while. Um, so, um, so that's the conflict of interest, which is I'm involved in running the study. Um, so right now we're sort of proactively identifying patients at our site. It's something where we need to do both images here. So it wouldn't be something where, you know, if you fly in, it might be a little bit difficult, but it certainly, you know, I think uh, support for it if, if you get wrong from either of our sites is, is very much appreciated. So what do you think the advantage would be to using mm. um, the copper sartate rather than the gallium um, mm. in the scanning? Yes, yes. And then I'm also hearing, and um, I think Lacnets did a, a webinar and I've only just watched about it 
third of it because I only just got the link this morning, but using copper sartate as a therapeutic as well. Mm. So what would be, I mean, what are the, some of the mm. theories? Because obviously yep. you won't trial something unless you have some mm. ideas about yeah. you know, how it's going to help. Mm. Okay, so this is where I need to put my disclaimer in, which is, as you know, I'm a medical oncologist. I pretend to know things about nuclear medicine, but there are a lot of people in Australia who know more about this stuff than I do. So I have done some research in it, but clinically, this is where, you know, if they say something and I say something else, they're right, I'm wrong. Okay, so, and we'll put which a is link the case for everything else. Dr. Okay. Grace, nuclear medicine physician, Dr. Grace Kong did a great video with us last mm. year. So I'll make sure yeah. there's a link to that in the notes. Yeah, so, well. so this is actually Grace Rotix, you know, like uh, Professor Roach, people at my um, univer uh, like institutions domain as well. But I mean, the way I understand it as an amateur is to say, well, if you have something that because of the different way you chemically engineer it, if it sticks around for a little bit longer, does that mean that it washes out of the liver quicker? Now, if it washes out of the liver over, okay, sorry, if it washes out of the liver at the same time, but it sticks around in the liver thing, then you can spot the liver thing a bit better, right? Because really you could- By liver thing, you mean liver tumor? The, the, the liver, liver tumor, that's right. So what I mean is, okay, if you give someone twice the amount of stuff, everything's gonna look twice as bright. If you give someone half the stuff, everything's going to look half as bright. But that's not the point. The point is, based on compared to the background, can you see a liver lesion that looks brighter than the background? So really, the critical thing isn't how much you give or how little you give. You know, there's there's thoughts about that, but it's can you see a big difference between liver lesions and the background of the liver? What's the ratio between those things? Because the bigger the ratio is, the more people can say this is definitely something or this is definitely not something and not unclear medicine, which used to be the nickname for nuclear medicine before PET scans came around, which is, oh, I'm not sure. Look, it looks a little bit brighter than the bit around it. It's about 10% brighter, but we're not quite sure. We'll just have to do another scan. And I think probably more than a quarter of you on the, on the call have had that kind of experience where we'd say, look, uncertain significance, we'll just have to watch it. We don't know what to do with it. So the better we can get that definition, seeing more stuff doesn't really matter to me right if you can see 10 things versus 15 things you're just using a better mark uh, you know um magnifying glass that that doesn't change what we do but if we know whether something is there or isn't there that does matter to to patients particularly when we're making big decisions um the other thing you talked about was therapeutics which is that i i guess um you know there's a potential to use prt using another form of copper um, but I'm just wary of, you know, infringing on uh, ph pharmaceutical, you, you know, studies. So that's something going forward, which is potentially, well, if you use the same thing rather than using the tissue for one and um, gallon for another. But this is all very preliminary at the moment. So these are some of the reasons we want to do the research and say, is this a goer? Is this not a goer? Certainly, this is not standard of care at the moment. I wouldn't be going to your centre saying, no, I heard Dr Chan say this is way better. I want to ditch all my usual stuff because we don't know what to do with it at the moment. But that's the point of doing the trial, isn't it? So it's a watch this space and... Uh, yeah. 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 Um, thank you. And I know that you said that, you know, um, you're providing an amateur perspective, but we don't see you as amateur. But also, um, I think sometimes it's helpful to have something explained by someone who's not... That's not mm. their main game because it mm. makes the explanation perhaps a little bit more um, simple to understand. Mm. So and I can see lots of comments in the in the note box with, um, you know, some people who are watching along. So which is really great. So you mentioned another a drug called pazuriatide. Um, mm. Tell me about that. Mm. So um, this is just something it didn't get a lot of airtime in ENET, to be honest. Um, pazuriatide is another um, uh, somatostatin analog like octreotide and lanreotide, which is under investigation. Um, people had looked at it um, a, a few years ago in trials of neuroendocrine uh, tumors and compared it to another somatostatin analog, and there wasn't enough of a significant difference between them. Um, on, on, the, on that particular trial, I won't go into the specifics, but that's why you haven't seen it sort of hit prime time over the last little while. So it was something that had been looked at over the last few years. Um, uh, this particular trial that um, was uh, summarised by the discussions um, looking at trials in Asia uh, and also Australia, 
um, is looking at, well, what if Octreotide doesn't work for particular patients, you know, is it potentially helpful there? So these are all things in evolution. Uh, not, this isn't even like, when we think about where things are for patients, there's prime time, which means funded, available, good evidence. Most things that are funded have good evidence because, you know, government. Second thing is good evidence, but not funded. Um, so we've got the trials, we don't have the funding. That's where advocacy often comes in, like Everolimus, is not for pancreatic tumors, for like mid gut or lung neuroendocrine tumors, for example. And then it's promising we need some randomized trials or more patients, which is the bit after that. So, you know, things where, look, yeah, we're promising 50 patients, good hit rate, want to know that it works better than something else. And then the next thing is maybe 10 patients. And this is the step before it. So these are all very, very, very preliminary things. I just have to emphasize that. This is probably five years and if, you know, from reaching prime time, if it works well. So the things where I think it's sometimes hard as a patient because you hear these sort of 30, 40 different options and, and we've got them, but I think part of the challenge is depending on the patient and the clinician, well, how can we have a good conversation about three or four of them in a visit without talking about the other 27, because I could cover 30, but that's 40 seconds each. Do you really want that kind of, you know, it's like the deep dive versus superficial kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I guess the short answer is it's a watch this space, but along with Correct. heaps of other potential watch this space type things. Correct, and, yep. um, and acknowledging that discomfort of sitting, needing treatment now. Mm, that's right. This, this, this therapeutic that I'm reading about in the news or, you know, I'm Googling or whatever, it might be five years away from being a funded treatment that we, that we can be confident about in Australia. Mm -hmm. And yep. yeah, but it's, I guess it's exciting to know that there's things in the pipeline and that's right. Yeah. 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 So um, I, in terms of what, what makes you most excited about clinical trials currently in Australia? Oh, actually, I worldwide. Think, let's go. Let's go big. What's making hmm. you most excited? I think looking at so it's not just these two, right? You know, there are lots of different um, uh, TKI. So it's not just cabozantinib, serifatinib. There's sort of four, five, six of these things, and I'm just sort of not going through all of them and the data just because of the lack of time. That's sort of one area where things are continuing to develop every couple of years. The second thing is that. Um, uh, I think in the next three or four years, we'll get more data about um, new versions of PRT. So going back to what we were saying before, remember how we were saying lutate is, you know, usually 177 lutetium, linker, dota, and then the octreotate. Now, octreotate is um, an agonist. So what that means is it attaches to the things, but there are other things called antagonists. And I know that sounds like the opposite, and it is, but all it does is it attaches to the same place but it stops it moving rather than activating it. And I'm not too fussed about those two things, but what seems to be the case is that some of these um, antagonists are bind better to the place. They, they stick better to their targets. So they don't sort of fall off as easily. In which case, well, you can imagine if the lutate we inject into people is more sticky to all the neuroendocrine cells. Well, that'd be cool. You know, that means that we can give the a lesser dose, you know, maybe less side effects for the same dosage or higher dosage or however have you. Um, these are things where, look, they are again under investigation, you know, but there's good stuff happening in Australian centers at the moment about that. Um, and a lot of things fall into that, that category in terms of modification of PRT. So I think that'll be an interesting thing going forward. Mm, oh, fantastic. Well, thank you. I'm going to give you a couple of other questions. And I didn't check with you, David, about what your hard deadline is. Um, I should have done that before we pressed the go live button on the, yeah. on the have you got any patients waiting in your waiting room? Right uh, now? I've, I've, got a, I've, got a, I've got a meeting sort of right after the end of this meeting. So we should probably, sorry about that. That's all good. So we'll, we'll, we'll try and keep it really snappy then. Can you just tell me straight out if I yep. really need to finish? <laughs> no, yep. I won't shut up. Mm. <laughs> Um, so we talked a bit about pasreotide being a somatostatin analogue and yep. knowing that the existing somatostatin analogues in Australia currently are the um, somatostatin mm. la and lanreotide. Um, so the question was, do some patients not require somatostatin analogues? And uh, just also the background, David, mm. is that we have done some videos in the past about 
receptors and how these drugs work. So I'll make sure I put mm. those links in the notes yeah, um, and people can go back and watch those videos mm. so we, we have the ABC yep. of how those drugs mm. actually work. But yep. benefits for arguments against mm. okay. what about long-term, post-PRRT? Mm. Okay. So I think as most people know, out of the treatments we give, semastan analogs tend to be one of the better tolerated ones. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone feels like there's no side effects, right? So, you know, for example, uh, diarrhea, tummy upset, you know, those things are pretty common. Some people feel like it improves after a few months, some people don't. Um, so things that are slightly less common include, well, high blood sugars. Some people get gallstones over, you know, a few years. But look, let's just take it back a step. Why do we need to start everyone who has a diagnosis on treatment immediately? Can we just watch it? Shouldn't we watch it? There are some people who might be more suitable for watch and wait. And what I mean by that is, look, you've got something. And I think a lot of people would say, I feel more comfortable being on something. You know, I feel psychologically like, well, at least I'm doing something about this, something that will cause it, whatever it takes off, even if we think that's unlikely for low-grade disease. Other people say, well, do I really have to have something, you know, what if I, I drive a truck and diarrhea for three days every month is really not so good? You know, if you're at home working from home, well, you don't want to take a Zoom call, but at least that's doable. But if you're on the road, that's not so doable, right? So I guess there are some circumstance things. People who are generally more suitable for watch and wait include people who are low grade, grade one. If we've had the luxury of having a few scans, scans that don't move very quickly. People with not much disease, if you've got a lot of disease, well, even a doubling of that might make you feel quite sick, right? You know, even if that took three years to happen. But if you only had a tiny skerrick of things and you really need to look hard or there's not many things, then those things help us. Some people think that small bowel things may be a little bit slower than pancreas things, you know, so those are, um, and also functionality. Well, if people are making hormones with the neuroendocrine tumor and they've got bad diarrhea and flushing, yeah, you could watch it. Maybe it's not going to move very quick, but, but is it going to make your quality of life bad? So that would be, so people with non-functional grade one, low volume, relatively slow moving things, those tend to be the ones that we sometimes think about watch and wait for. It's an ongoing source of debate. And I think I've talked about it a couple of times in the last week. You know, someone's like, well, it looks fine. Can we stop it for a while? I'm like, well, I guess so, you know. But, but I mean, just at the start of the journey, I think it's that balance. Some people would say, I don't, I think it's probably not moving very fast. Could we just do a scan in three months and see? And, you know, often we're fine. And so that's a, I think it's a good discussion to have with physicians right up at the start of diagnosis. A second slightly more complicated question is I've been stable, can I be on a break of it? And then I'd say the question is, well, if you're stable on it, some people feel like, look, I just want to be off. I just don't want to have a needle once a month. And that makes sense. Other people say, well, if it's working, should we really change it? You know, should we, should we roll the dice? And, and it's almost the psychological aspect that that sort of dominates the discussions over the medical reasons, isn't it? Neither are, neither are wrong, wrong, because the trials just said, well, if you had something straight up versus not having it, it took longer for disease to, to act up. And, and that's true. That's what the trials showed. But what it doesn't tell us is if you kept on going right from, say, today, March the 26th, and had something, versus if you just watched it and started a bit later on, well, is there any difference to landing in trouble or the thing is not working? And, and I don't think we know that at the moment. Mm. So, and I guess one thing that I've learned over talking to people from all different parts of mm. Australia who are under all different sorts of oncologists, mm. um, as patients, you have different sort of levels of comfort with not doing something or feeling like you absolutely have to do everything in the book. Um, but mm. I think there's oncologists who have various opinions about that too, because it sounds yes. like it's not completely clear cut in the literature mm. yet. So it, it isn't, that's right. Yeah. And, and so I think because of those factors, I think really the important thing is to go, well, what's important to the patient? Yeah. And what ways in which, uh, you know, what ways can, can things go wrong and well, should we, shouldn't we? I, I think it's hard to have a definitive yes or no answer to that one. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm going to ask you another question about somatostatin analogs. Um, yep. And and this person talked about their situation, but it was actually something that I think we can take more broadly. So this person's been on um, lanreotide or as you know, all somatostatin lyre. They've been on an as a somatostatin analog injection. Um, lots of the areas are of disease on their scan looked stable, but now there's new tumors cropping up. Um, so the question is, but but then lots of the tumours look stable. So the yep. question was, is it normal for somatostatin analogues to have the ability to stabilise one area and yet we seem to have tumors, new tumours growing in somewhere mm. else? Yep. And that's a really good question. And I think this is something that is and personally very interesting in neuroendocrine research. I guess the way that I'd say it is, well, why is it? that some parts of it is under control and some parts of it isn't. And we see this fairly often. It's not just with somatostatin analogs. After lutate, sometimes that happens, right? Lots of areas frozen, this area is growing. What do we do about that area? And, and so I think it means that probably there is some heterogeneity in the tumor. What that means is, well, we're sort of saying that all the tumor should look exactly the same. But the truth is a little bit more complex as usually it is. Um, which means that sometimes you have cells that look a little bit different in different parts of the body and genetic studies and other studies have shown this quite well. Things can change between different patients. We know that. They can change in different parts of the same patient. That's intra-patient heterogeneity. So the thing in the liver is not the same thing as the thing in the bowel, maybe. You know, so that's why one might not respond, the other one does. And more complicatedly, things may change over time. So the same spot in the liver might be different a few years later on. This is all stuff where it's kind of hard to do research on or make definitive conclusions on because the only way to do it, right, to be really sure, for example, do things change over time is, well, you have a liver metastasis, you cut it out, you replace it back, and then you wait for it for three years and then you take it out again. But you can see, obviously that's not possible and neither would it be very comfortable. So the things where I think nuclear medicine has a role to play in predicting behavior or sort of going, well, one of the promises of nuclear medicine, we haven't gotten there, I think we're a long way away, is can we tell what's happening between the different tumors in the body, the different metastasis sites? Are some of them more aggressive than others? Should we do a biopsy or not? What treatment should we use based on those findings? There's some of the research things that we're wrestling with at the moment, and hopefully we'll make some inroads in the next few years. Um, unfortunately common, and you know, sorry that parts of it haven't been completely controlled, it sounds like. It, it does happen. Um, and that's where we'd say, look, the general approach would be, is it acting up in one place? Can we sap that place or cut it out? Or is it happening in a few places? Should we use something that is more sort of covers every, every area in the body? And um, I'll post a video to a talk that um, one of our New Zealand colleagues did around the genomic sequences and comparing oh, great. different yeah. tumours in the same person and demonstrating there mm -hmm. being quite a lot of mutations, which was really fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know for some patients, I'm imagining this is why people would need to have, or they'd be suggested to have another biopsy or a biopsy of a new mm -hmm. lesion when they've yeah. already had a biopsy or some tumour taken out already. Yeah. That's right. And, you know, biopsies are hard because they're uncomfortable. They take a few weeks to come back sometimes or at least a few days. Why do we need it anyway? And I think that's where we'd say, well, PET scans are good. But we don't think PET scans, I don't think PET scans at the stage where I can tell you exactly what's happening in that tumour. I can have a good gander, but sometimes it really matters to find out for sure. And that's where biopsy is helpful. Mm, mm. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I just, I'm picking through thinking we need to finish up in just a minute. Um, I, I have two more questions, which I'm hoping won't take too long, but you can yeah, always say, let's we, we come back to them an, another okay. time. Yeah. And uh, maybe hopefully we can invite you back um, to, to do another Q&A session, David, because mm. this was a very popular one for people putting questions in. Um, 
the first one was um, there is a bit of you know in a in a national group there is a bit of comparing notes between um, yes. people who are being treated in Victoria and people who are being treated in Queensland and yeah. and etc. Um, so there is a, a new app that Peter Mack have put out. Actually, they're putting out apps all the time. There's a really interesting yeah. one about listening of recording consultations, but that's a conversation for another day. But um, there is a new app for Peter Mac patients where they can access their scan and blood results. Um, I, I know that we actually put together a poster on, on this sort of issue for ENETS and I'm going to try and get a picture mm -hmm. of it in the group. But um, patients can access all of their results in one app. Is there any plan for that kind of thing that mm. you're aware of at Royal yeah. North Shore or other places yeah. in Australia? I guess there's two challenges, I think, in terms of integrated systems. One is the resources to build a system and two is integration of data. I think that we're in slightly different boats, to be honest. I've got patients who get PET scans in PRP, you know, which is one of the imaging providers in New South Wales, patients who get it locally, patients in other places. And part of the challenge is that for each of those places, for each pathology provider, we would need to draft a separate legal agreement, potentially, in order to get all the data into here, not on a per, like on a per patient scale, it's easy, but if you're saying, I want to suck all your data into the app in order to do it, then that's a different level of legal complexity. And, uh, you know, obviously lawyers on both sides are quite keen to make sure the institutions are protected. And, and so that's sometimes a, a barrier. Um, whereas I think Peter Mac tends to have a little bit more of their imaging and their, and their pathology in-house. So, you know, that might be something I'm, I'm not aware of the exact things. I guess the second thing is um, it's really great what Peter Mac have managed to do. And, you know, obviously it's a cancer center. Um, I guess I work at a hospital where I'm proud to be part of the oncology department and I'd like to think we provide good service, but because we are not a designated cancer only hospital, there's sometimes a little bit less room to move in terms of cancer specific initiatives. And, you know, and, and so I think this is where, you know, we want to try and emulate and, you know, provide good things for, for patients going forward. Um, but at the same time, I guess the question is, well, which one is the biggest priority at the moment? Mm -hmm. Is it talking to patients? Is it the research? Is it trying to get things like the Centre of Excellence Initiative up and running? Is it other things? Is it spending time talking to you guys? All these things are good. And the obvious answer is I should sleep less. And I really am trying to do that, but I haven't quite managed to get it yet. So we'll I, mean, I think if one thing um, shines, and maybe this is maybe this is a good note to finish on, um, David. One thing that I've got shines, 10 more minutes. If, if pardon? I've got 10 more minutes. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah, as long as I didn't want to cut if you, you guys are bored, you should feel free to log off. I'm not monitoring. There is nobody you. bored. There is nobody bored in the in the group. Um, what I was going to say is that one thing that people really are very much appreciate um, in the patient community is the, the passion and the commitment and the drive yeah. of um, people like yourself. But, you know, around Australia, we've got these fantastically driven and motivated and very collaborative um, oncologists and nuclear yeah. medicine physicians and scientists and surgeons and the whole multidisciplinary Chernobyl and mm. uh, caboodle. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask you another question, um, uh, which will be... So let's let's give you one that might be interesting to see if we can limit it to the time. But mm. one person asked, why is surgery so prevalent in late stage neuroendocrine tumors over in the USA? And they said also China, but not in Australia. Thoughts? I think it'd be interesting to see the data on surgery in late stage in US and China compared to Australia. I'm not aware of any firm studies that say, look, it's been much more done there. I, I know maybe like, you know, there's a feel on discussion groups and, you know, that's certainly important and, and worthwhile. But I think the question is really, should we do surgery in late stage neuroendocrine tumors or, or not? And I think the answer is, well, there are some positives and some negatives. If you try and do surgery, I guess the promise is, well, it turns back the clock in terms of how much stuff there is. 
So maybe if you have, say, a magic magnet and you suck out stuff and there's a kilogram of stuff and you cut out 900 grams of stuff, well, then there's 100 grams of stuff left. You've sort of reduced it by 90%. That's pretty good. What is the opportunity cost of that? Well, people get weak, long stay, missing out on other therapy that might do the same without the equivalent physical cost, you know, in terms of the body. Um, and in some cases, um, monetary cost, financial toxicity, you know, what if someone said, well, we could do this in the public, but well, really we'd have to do it in the private because wait times, but you really need to mortgage your house. And then we'd say, well, okay, what is the evidence behind it anyway? And the evidence is a little bit mixed, to be honest. Um, there's no randomized trial, which kind of makes sense. Okay, think through with me. You have 100 people who sign up to a trial. They say you're going to flip a coin. The people who are heads, you'll get big surgery and be out for eight weeks and the other people won't. Now, most people would say, well, I don't really want that kind of big decision to be driven by a coin toss, in which case then you can't really have a randomized trial about that thing. There are some retrospective studies looking backwards at, at data that says, well, maybe people who have big surgery, maybe survival is a little bit longer, which is true, but are the people having surgery, the people who are healthier, better, lower grade anyway, and, and so we've never really been able to tease that one out for sure. Where I think it is, is to say, well, surgery should be considered for select cases on a case-by-case -case basis. Surgery, I think it would be wrong to have surgery on everyone in that scenario. Equally, it is wrong not to have surgery on anyone. I think it's very much, look, what does the surgeon think? Decision in a multidisciplinary sense, ideally with some imaging, and to see where it is. So very tricky. And we haven't even talked about the difference between functional and non-functional. So sorry to hear that perception. I don't think it's for lack of trying, but those are some of the complexities in the situation. That's fantastic. And David, I'm just, I'm, I'm watching the clock, but I'm realizing, I'm, I don't know if you can see the panic on my face that I promised everybody I would ask you about the net test. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, it's the probably the first thing that everyone asked about. And it's the last thing that I've remembered to ask yeah. you. Have you got time to just quickly tell us about, I'm so sorry, we might need to make another we, we, we do. Um, I'm just conscious that it's important for me not to be, um, what's the word, uh, not to be under under action for saying ill things about people's commercially available tests and things like that. Um, anyway, we can talk about circulation of this talk later. But I think like um, when we talk about the net test, it's something that is commercially available with difficulty, which means that realistically to do it, we'd need to send to the US for some stuff. They send us the stuff. The patient pays a few hundred dollars and then we send it off to the um, to the lab and then we get a number back. The net test is a blood-based assay and depending on the situation, it sounds like they have tailored the test to different situations, which is good and bad. It's good because you sort of say, well, this is the net test for say PRT, but we don't really know what the difference that is between that one and another one. And is it optimized? Like, I mean, if you have, how do I put it? Um, if you keep on changing the test very slightly, but you've got 50 publications and they're sort of all in slightly different tests, is it the same test or are they slightly different tests under the same banner? The second thing I think that is a bit difficult is I think for them, they um, sell it as commercially privileged information. And it is, right? As opposed to the usual, these are the 52 genes we're testing. They say, well, um, we, are, we can't tell you because you try and copy it. And in the same black box model as the radiomics I talked about initially, um, it's a little bit harder, I think, for clinicians to sort of go, look, this is definitely what's going on. This is what the test represents. This is why you should be doing it or not. In which case, I think there are some promising signs to do with the net test. I think that the more data we have, the more comfortable we would theoretically be. And I think what we need is ideally some Australian data on look what the run times are, how long it takes. I guess the thing for me is you could say, well, you could just do one as few as a few hundred, right? You know, that's not a coffee. That's about 50 avocados on toast. But it is, you know, you know, most people could say, well, look, if it really changes things. But 
the way that the publication seem to be doing it is to say, well, we need to do net test every three months or six months. In which case you can see those numbers adding up very quickly. And I talk about this, I think a bit with my patients, which is, okay, if I honestly said right now, I, I don't know whether it's gonna change treatment. Well, is it better to have a really, really nice weekend out? Is it better to have this information, but I tell you, I actually don't know what to do with it and neither does, you know, do other people. What are the, what's the anticipated change in treatment? as a result of this test. That's where I think it's at, where we'd say, look, how would it change our treatment if we did one test or two tests or three tests? And if between the patient and the clinician, we said, look, it definitely changed something, if X, Y, Z, then maybe we should do it. But if the answer is honestly, look, if all the other tests are pointing the right way and this is pointing the wrong way, it wouldn't change a thing. And if all the other tests are pointing the right way and this is pointing the right way, we wouldn't change a thing. They're not gonna change a thing either way. That's sort of where I, I think for me, a test with cost, we just need to justify its importance in how we make decisions. So waiting for more information on that and probably- I think that would be nice, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look, David, we are so grateful um, to you for spending this, this time with us. Um, and mm. I know that it's an extremely busy day. And so um, we're anxious to not keep you too long. We so appreciate you joining us. Would we be able to invite you back for an encore, perhaps, <laughs> you know, 2022 or, um, yeah, sure. you know, in the future? Because yeah. I know these questions. It depends on how many lawsuits I get hit with as a result of my unfiltered okay. talking. So let's watch this space too. But presumably you're not in jail and that they're still letting you out there. That's we would right. just love to have you back. And and thank you so much. I can see some comments from the from the people who have viewed. One last burning question, maybe? Beg your pardon? One last burning question from the comments. Yeah, any any burning questions from anybody? While they, while they're thinking, they might just type one. There was one thing that I said I was going to ask you, and I think it's going to be a quick answer, which yeah. was um relating to two tests that I think are not available in Australia, what are they and would they mm -hmm. be as yeah. soon or in the future? Five, HTP and substance mm -hmm. P. Can you tell us anything about those? Five, HTP and substance P are both things that have to do with functional neuroendocrine tumors. So they're both hormones that are related to other hormones that may cause symptoms from carcinoid syndrome. So for example, we think that serotonin is more to do with diarrhea. There's other things that have to do with flushing substance P is sometimes implicated as one of them. The answer is, look, not the biochemist, but I think it's, they're not tested in wide circulation. So 5-HTP is 5-hydroxytryptophan. And if you remember, tryptophan has to, something to do with serotonin. So it's one of the things in the serotonin pathway there was an interesting abstract in ENET about plasma, 5-HIAA. I'd be really keen on that because it means that I don't have to tell my patients to have dietary restrictions and 25 urine collections. And I think people will be very keen on that. But that would be the one for me that makes the most sense in terms of serotonin making that better rather than 5-HTP. Watch this space, you know, happy to be informed. Um, substance P, um, I think it's just, I think these are testament to the fact that we still can't test for functional net in general, all that well. We've got tests, it's just that there's so many hormones, right? Do you test for all of them, none of them, cost, sensitivity, how long it takes to come back? And these are all challenges that we need to keep whistling away at. That's very succinct and wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think everybody is just going encore, encore, and and many mm. thank you. So, um, no worries. David, I know you've got another another meeting starting, mm. so you're welcome to press the little red button. I've got a couple <laughs> of housekeeping things to plug away for New mm -hmm. Cancer Australia. No worries. Well, We're so thank, grateful. Thanks for making the time. Uh, hopefully, it was helpful. Um, and yeah, we'll see you around. Absolutely. Thank you so okay. much, David. Thanks. Okay. Bye. And you've got me just for a minute because I wanted to just give you a, a couple of little plugs before I finish up today. The first thing is um, I wanted to say just a big hello to, we've got quite a lot of our unicorns um, gathering up for an inpatient gathering up in the on the Gold Coast. Um, 
so jealous I couldn't join you um, and I know there's lots of people who are around Australia who just would love to give you a wave and a shout out and go you know party hard um, go gently enjoy being with each other I think a, a gathering of unicorns traditionally is called a blessing and I know I see so much of that um, in our virtual gatherings but so special to be in the same space physically as other people um, with neuroendocrine cancers so have fun and don't party too well yet yeah, no Go, go and party. Um, also, just to let you know, if you haven't seen news, there is um, Queensland have just announced that there's been someone walking around for a week with COVID in the community. So just be careful with the hand sanitizer and the masks and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so two things I wanted to just really briefly plug today. The first thing is that in, um, Queensland aren't getting all of the unicorn love in terms of gatherings. So there is a an event that I wanted to plug back down here in freezing cold Melbourne, um, which is on April 17. It's a, um, a hot rod show at the Coburg Drive-In. They're going to show Grease the movie, which will be pretty fun and exciting. So if you're in Melbourne... I, I've been assured that you don't need a fancy car to turn up to this thing, which is great because I'm turning up with my family station wagon um, and, and getting on some bit of grease action. So it's a fundraising event for Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia and we're really um, grateful to the crew who, who are organising that one for us. So there's um, there was an update about that on our Facebook page is probably the easiest way for the people who are watching right now um, to, to see that information. Otherwise, on our website, I'll make sure there's a link. Um, the other thing I was just going to plug is that this afternoon we've got our online Zoom um, monthly meeting for people in our private Facebook private discussion group. So um, I think a few people were interested in just having a chat. There's no set agenda for those meetings. There's no guest speakers. It's just a chance to, uh, I guess, hang out with each other and see each other's faces and hear each other's voices. I'll be there for that meeting. So if you've got questions for me, um, I'll be happy to have my brain stretched and see what I can do about answering them. Um, so that starts, uh, if you're in Melbourne, it starts at 2.30. So it's in half an hour if you're watching this live. Um, so enough time to go and grab a drink of water and something quickly to eat and then um, I'll see whoever turns up in the Zoom room in half an hour. So look, um, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. There's been a, um, a great group of people um, chatting along in the comments, which is always lovely to see. Um, I will look forward to seeing you. Oh, I should, I should plug next week's Facebook Friday. I think we have got someone coming in. Oh, next Friday is Good Friday. Um, so there will not be a Facebook Friday next week. I may do, I've yet to decide whether I might do a little extra Facebook Thursday next week. Um, that's a watch this space. It might be a bit of a surprise package. But the following Friday, which is Friday the 9th of April, we've got a follow-up session from a researcher who came and joined us last year um, talking about precision and the, per, the precision and the person study and a lot of patients with nets from our groups actually joined that study and um, that research is going to come and give us an update and find out tell us what they actually found out which I think is really lovely to get um, some feedback about what everybody told them about precision based medicine so anyway that's in a fortnight I'm going to shut up because clearly I've been talking too long and I'm losing track of my words. It's been lovely to spend this last hour with you all. I hope you take care. If I get to see you this afternoon in the online Zoom group, that'd be great. Otherwise, um, I'll, I'll see you at one of our upcoming Facebook Fridays. Take care, everybody.